Hello, my name is Dave Collins. I'm a recently retired staff member, University of Texas, where I was a clinic manager in the psychology department. I have a long-standing interest in contemplative traditions, uh, particularly cross-cultural parallels in contemplative meditative techniques and experiences. Um, for this presentation, I'm going to be looking at the use of the breath in old school Buddhist jhana practice. Jhana is uh, absorption practices. Um, I'm going to start the slideshow here. Coming up. So for this talk, I'm going to focus mostly on what's listed here as the third item, the actual experience, the phenomenological characteristics of jhana absorption practice. But I'm going to begin with a quick overview of uh, some basic meditative principles, including um, a note on cross-cultural parallels as well as a note on the place, the somewhat debated or even controversial role of altered states in contemplative traditions. And in this instance, specifically in uh, Buddhism, I'll include a note on um, some of the implications for this topic and this realm of human experience for our understandings of what in our day get compartmentalized often conceptually as either religion or philosophy or psychology. I'm going to offer the suggestion that looking at contemplative procedures, meditative experience, it's in effect all of the above and helps us to appreciate ways in which we've historically constructed some of those concepts. I use the term old school Buddhism uh, essentially to, to gesture towards uh, forms of Buddhism today, primarily extant in uh, South Asia um, and most uh, uh, classically in our day, exemplified in the Theravada tradition. But essentially those forms of Buddhism, which were in effect uh, before the rise of, of Mahayana. And for those schools, there was largely two categorical rubrics or baskets into which meditative techniques were placed conceptually. Uh, samatha and Vipassana. I'll be usually using the Pali terms for this talk. Uh, samatha is calming, concentrative techniques, while vipassana are the insight practices. Somewhat uh, pithily um, translated in, the, for example, some Chinese Buddhist texts as stopping and seeing. Paying attention, getting in touch connecting with our experience of the moment, which often affects what I'm going to suggest here is a deconstruction of our thought identity. We tend to associate our sense of ourselves with our waking state, discursive, cognitive process. And there are many forms of meditation, lots of ways to do contemplative techniques and practices, but a lot of them entail shifting our sense of our identity in terms of thoughts and in a way looking to appreciate thoughts as another phenomenal occurrence, another experience. So much of meditation is having a relationship with our current experience. Uh, 
That kind of intimacy, that kind of relationship is often fostered by quieting our thoughts somewhat, either through attending to something else, like uh, the experience of the breath, or in some traditions, uh, a repeated word or sound, like a mantra, or simply watching phenomena rise in our experience, and particularly watching thoughts come and go. In the West, um, again, there's also a rich and uh, varied uh, tradition of meditative teachings and practices. Um, I'm particularly interested personally in the so-called via negativa, the negative way, the letting go, the apophatic uh, style of contemplative practices in the West. Um, eminently exemplified in a uh, 14th century, probably Carthusian work anonymously written in England called The Cloud of Unknowing, where there its author looks to cultivate an intimacy with current experience, which he'll ultimately re reference as a naked, blind feeling of being more immediate, more simple than thoughts and cogitations, for which a technique, a help, um, he recommends, is a repeated one word, one syllable thought, much like uh, a mantra. And that technique, it tickles my mind, he calls a slight, S-L-E-I-G-H-T, which um, in modern English, of course, we have in the phrase a sleight of hand, a kind of trick or a skillful uh, measure. Um, the Middle English, uh, the word is also related to our word sly, which in Middle English more often had the connotation of, of wisdom or wise. So that's the 14th century looking to get really simple, really basic, more simple, more immediate than cogitative processes, coming to rest in a naked, blind feeling of being. On the opposite side of the world, a century before, Dogen brings the Soto style of um, Zen Buddhist practice to Japan. Very different cultural framework, very different vocabulary, very similar approach to meditation practice. He speaks of non-thinking, getting past words and thoughts into something more fundamental, immediate, original, and as a skillful means towards that end, a slight, if you will, he'll advocate being mindful of the breath and coming to rest in uh, sort of an embrace with suchness. What's always already here before we have a philosophy, a religion, an outlook, a concept. There's the question with some of these techniques, whether we're talking about something uh, quintessentially or exclusively religious, whether this, given that it doesn't require a lot in the way of, of, of belief invocation, it's so experiential, whether it's more philosophy than religion. As you know, perhaps um, early on in the West, uh, studies of comparative religion, it was um, debated for a time whether or not Buddhism should be better considered a religion or a philosophy which to my mind very much speaks to how those concepts, what's religion, what's philosophy, have a history. It's the way folks in the West tend to look at things. And of course, isn't the only way everyone in the world lives and sees what practices in their lives have most uh, worth and, and meaning to them. And even more recently, there's questions about whether 
This is all reducible to uh, neuropsychological processes and are better understood, appreciated, approached, analyzed through psychology. Pierre Hadot is uh, fairly well known these days for reminding us in the West how much of the early forms of Western philosophy were lifestyles. They were very much connected to transformation of outlooks and experiences and concrete, physical, sometimes exercises. So all in all, a point I'd like to um, underscore is how much of what I'll be speaking about in terms of contemplative practices, meditative processes, are that processes, experiential processes, less to do with what we in the West in the last couple of centuries especially have come to sort of presume is a, a, a creedal affair, a, a conceptual matter of uh, adherence to claims or beliefs. Again, it's eminently practical experiential processes. Um, a quick note on the words jhana, jhana, and zen. This talk is going to focus on the phenomenology of jhana absorption practices through the breath. Jhana is a Pali word, old school Buddhist term, referring to these absorption states derived from an older Indic Sanskrit word, jhana, which had a number of uh, uses, but essentially denoted a kind of mental cultivation and came to be used to refer, one of the words used to refer to meditation and jhana was pronounced chan in China or chana and zen in Japan and became, of course, a moniker, a, a label for the school there, which so focused within Buddhism on meditation, the chan school, the zen school. So those are all family related terms. I'm going to show next a chart of, say, I have a, a background in both psychology and uh, religious studies, and uh, I've had advisors in each field who were pretty sure my interest would be better suited in the other field. In recent years, there's been an explosion of interest in psychology and medical applications of what has come to be called uh, mindfulness. Mindfulness, pretty much a translation for the um, Buddhist term sati. I um, playfully suggest in a little online essay that um, while very laudable, that are looking to catch up with the world's contemplatives in appreciating the worth and wonder of uh, meditative practices, mindfulness. I have a concern that um, some investigators are over quick in um, deciding what is entailed in the end, in its fullness. Um, here's a quick chart of the literal explosion of studies. A couple years back, this was recorded and it's only continued since. Um, the number of, of studies being published on mindfulness in psychology and medical applications. Mindfulness, or um, perhaps better translated, a, a kind of uh, remembering the present is a foundational starting place, um, especially in old school Buddhism for uh, meditative processes. There are further um, demarcations, further applications of meditative process in the direction of more concerted 
um, concentrative exercises, and as I alluded to earlier, uh, insight types of techniques. And with some of the concentration procedures, of which jhana is a preeminent example, um, you can have states of experience where at a marked remove from our habitual modes of functioning, altered states, special states. And there can be a debate over the role, the place of such alteration of experience and consciousness in a tradition, in a path towards appreciating what it is to be alive. So you can get debates over whether uh, there are downsides to having quote unquote special experiences. There are analogous questions about whether um, uh, altering consciousness is, is, is a, 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 a kind of a, a necessary and perhaps um, deleterious agitation of our psyches as distinct from simply uh, cultivating a kind of mindful observing presence. In Buddhist currents, which do um, embrace the altered states, the jhana absorptions, um, you sometimes get the, uh, uh, the label for them as wet practitioners, wet Buddhists, as distinct from the dry camp, which forgoes jhana absorption and looks to focus on mindfulness leading into uh, insight and vipassana styles of, of practice. And within folks who do embrace jhana practice, there's some range in um, how they're conceptualized, how they're schematized, and um, how intense or not jhanas are understood to be. There are even debates going way back as to whether jhana is even Buddhist. Some suggesting it's preeminently Buddhist, others feeling, well, this was borrowed from almost in a concession from uh, currents already occurring in India before the Buddha lived and are effectively Hindu practices. But the role of jhana in the old Pali suttas, the, the early Buddhist texts, is pretty uh, preeminent. Um, the Buddha in his biography is depicted as having done some years of rather harsh, ascetic, body-denying activities. Um, and as part of the uh, account of his uh, awakening, the night of his awakening, he alludes to them, or is reported to as alluding to them. But with this racking practice of austerities, I haven't attained any superior human state, any distinction in knowledge or vision worthy of the noble ones, could there be another path to awakening? He's sitting under the enlightenment tree, the Bodhi tree, as this uh, portrayal has it, and recalls once when my father, the Sakyan, was working um, either in the field or in preparation for a festival, while I was sitting in the cool shade of a rose apple tree, this is when he's a child, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from, un from unwholesome mental states, I entered and remained in the first jhana. Rapture and pleasure born from seclusion, accompanied by direct attention and sustained attention, and I'm going to be unpacking those terms momentarily. Could that be the path to awakening? Then following on that memory came the realization that is the path to awakening. So in this account of the pivotal moment of Buddha's biography, his coming to awakening, jhana, 
the recollection of John, the wholesomeness, the pleasure, the joy have a pivotal role. In our day, in this part of the world, I'm speaking as a, as a Western American, it's only been the last few years, the last couple decades at most, that uh, a significant attention is being given to the jhanas and their um, practice and, and instruction for their practice. Um, large part of that is a historical consequence of some of the preeminent um, um, teachers of Buddhist meditation in the West, folks like uh, uh, Jack Kornfield, Joseph Goldstein of the Insight Meditation Society, and uh, S.N. Goenka um, from South Asia, were trained in part in the Burmese tradition, out of which um, there'd been a his the historical consequence with colonization of the British, a effort to um, 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 maintain Buddhist culture included monks teaching lay people how to meditate. And the style they taught was the sati vipassana style, the mindfulness and insight style, leaving out the jhanas, the absorption concentration practices. Given that in that part of the world, the way the jhanas were uh, studied and practiced and experienced by the monks was um, rather intensive and not so easy to um, have occur. So those were left out. They were never altogether forgotten. And this figure, Paul Sayadaw, is a teacher of the teacher I've worked with most um, in learning the jhanas and has focused rather heavily on the old school, hardcore instruction in jhana techniques. These are a couple of his preeminent students. I've worked with uh, Shaila Catherine. Um, Park is pictured in the other picture with uh, Stephen Snyder and Tina Rasmussen. Uh, each of these folks have written books um, in the 2000, 2008, 2009 on how to practice jhana. Um, they are, and I'm going to say more about this, in the camp of the more intensive, more demanding, and more, um, I don't know a better way to put it, the more altered uh, forms of jhana absorption. There are other teachers. Uh, Lee Brasington um, was a student of the uh, Western uh, Buddhist uh, Ayakema for whom um, right concentration and jhana absorption is a rather more relaxed um, endeavor. And then there are folks um, like Rob Berbia who are not so much self-taught, but quite eclectic in the types of uh, uh, training they've undergone and are also teaching jhana these days. Um, I've worked some with uh, Richard Shankman, a sweetheart of a teacher, but also quite um, eclectic. And uh, this book, Experience of Samadhi, he canvasses a number of contemporary teachers for their varying attitudes or approaches to jhana practice. And as a quick little side note, he's got a more recent book, the subtitle of which is Mindfulness, Concentration, and Insight. And there, again, is sort of the basic old school categories of mental cultivation, of, of styles and approaches to um, meditation practice. Mindfulness being sati, concentration being samadhi, and the other big category, uh, vipassana being insight. 
And just for fun, a couple of pictures of the retreat center where I've done a number of jhana techniques, jhana retreats, that is. And then to go back to the enlightenment story of the Buddha, um, he's been recollected to, he's been reconnected with that experience of, of joy and wholesome good feeling that wasn't a matter of, of sensual preoccupation, but was born of his own heart and mind. He remembered entering the jhana, so absorption under the apple tree, um, the rose apple tree in his childhood. And that has given him a shifted perspective on austerity and being so hard and demanding and punishing on oneself as an ascetic, looking to a more balanced, more enjoyable, more beauty embracing approach to appreciating life's worth and wonder and meaning. So he took some food, <laughs> he'd been starving himself and regained strength. Then quite secluded from sensual pleasures Secluded from unwholesome mental qualities, I entered and remained in the first jhana. Rapture and pleasure, born from seclusion, accompanied by directed attention and sustained attention. So on the one hand, it's a narrative, it's a story, it's a portrait of the Buddha on the verge of awakening. On the other, there are a number of technical terms in here. And I'm going to outline some of the major ones. And I have an asterisk for a pair of terms which are more evident in commentarial materials than they are in the old Sutta collections. And this is part of the division or one of the divisions between approaches to jhana practice. The commentarial traditions, Abhidhamma, and especially Buddha Gosa's uh, the Sudhimaga, um, very scholastic, very precise, and in this instance, rather demanding in how they understand what real jhana experience entails. So among the classic um, 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 criteria or, or the analytic elements of jhana practice, these terms have uh, more straightforward um, conventional applications in ordinary language, but bring on a sort of specialized um, application in the um, uh, discourse or description of jhana practice and experience. Vitaka and vichara are attentional modalities. Um, they're in the conventional application forms of thought, but in jhana absorptive meditation, vitaka is sort of the original orientation towards a given object. And for this talk, that object, I'm going to illustrate the jhana practice th through uh, that object being the breath. Vichara is a sustained attentional connection with that object, with the breath. One analogy I've heard is that vitaka is like a bee honing in on a flower, that sort of attentional um, orientation. And vichara is the bee in the flower, <laughs> hanging out there, resting in there, active in there. A kagata um, literally means um, uh, one pointedness. And um, again, I'm going to give a little analogy coming up for this. Um, but it's, it's, you have no more difficulty 
attending to the breath. You see it. You're with it. It's unwavering. And when you get into that unwavered, locked on relationship or state, piti and sukha arise. Piti is rapture. It's exhilaration. It feels really, really good. Sukha is a calmer, sometimes more pervasive happiness, a sort of quiet pleasure and contentment. And then further refined is a state of upeka, um, just a sort of quiet, accepting, equanimous state or mode of functioning. The commentaries add attention to what is called the Patipanga Nimitta. Um, and I'll say what this is uh, coming up in the description of um, the phenomenology, what it's like to experience jhana through the breath. Uh, nimitta has a sort of wide application um, it simply means um, an appearance, a, a phenomenon, a, a sign. But I'll say more about this coming up. First, though, here are classic descriptions of each of the jhana. I'm going to be talking about the four uh, form jhanas, the rupa jhanas. There are others, um, formless and more rarefied states. But for this talk, I'm going to speak uh, to the form jhanas uh, largely because, because they're easier to talk about and largely because I personally have um, um, immediate experience with these and only shaky, um, transient, and limited experience with the formless jhanas. So the first form jhana in the classic description is uh, depicted this way. Here, secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome mental states, a uh, monk, a bhikkhu, enters and remains in the first jhana, which consists of rapture and pleasure, born of seclusion, accompanied by directed attention and sustained attention. Again, these are uh, terms we, we've seen alluded to already, and they show up time and again in the accounts of the jhanas in the Pali suttas, the discourses. He makes the rapture and pleasure born of seclusion drench, steep, fill, and pervade this body so that there is no part of this whole body that is not pervaded by the rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. And each of these four jhanas uh, is provided a simile for description. Um, I didn't have a more... A compelling image I could find online for this one, but that's a soap powder ball. And in the first jhana, that's the simile um, um, referent. Just as a skillful bathman might pour bath powder in a metal basin and sprinkling it little by little with water, would knead it until the moisture soaks its ball of bath powder, saturates it, and spreads through it inside and out, so too, the bhikkhu, the monk, makes the rapture and happiness born of seclusion drench, steep, fill, and pervade this body so that there is no part of his whole body that's not pervaded by the rapture and happiness born of seclusion. This is the first development of right concentration. So this is the first jhana. And again, that phrase, born of seclusion, is um, a sort of uh, intentional uh, note that this isn't about a sensory, bodily, ordinary pleasure. It's not about um, engaging in some physical activity that makes you feel good. This is um, a kind of joy that's born of the heart is born of the mind, a heart and mind that are um, present to themselves, present to the phenomenology of, of, of 
living experience rather than uh, something more uh, um, typical uh, and by way of a, a sensory um, um, preoccupation or good time. I'm one of the folks <laughs> for whom allowing myself to know joy and this kind of uh, rarefied pleasure was a challenge. I sort of had the framework that meditation, spiritual practice is work. <laughs> this is, you won't realize jhana absorption if you are prejudiced against having pleasure. These states feel powerfully nice. The second jhana is described this way. Again, with the subsiding of applied attention and sustained attention. So I'll interrupt myself. The course of the jhanas from first to fourth is a progression of ever decreasing agitation, being all the more still and clear and simple. So where the first jhana was characterized by, by um, um, attention to an object, and I'm going to follow this up with, um, after giving the outline of the four, John is follow up with a concrete account of using the breath for these. Um, the sense of separation from your object, that falls away, becomes more unified, less um, complicated. Again, I'm going to give up account, an illustration from my personal experience, what this is like, which, which this point may be clearer there. A bhikkhu enters and dwells in the second jhana, which has internal placidity and unification of mind and consists of rapture and pleasure born of concentration without applied attention and sustained attention. So the vitaka and the vichara, those attentional mental orientation processes, fall away. You don't need them. You are in the jhana. Uh, rapture and happiness, born of concentration, remain, drench, steep, fill, pervade the body. So there's no part of the body that's not pervaded by the rapture and happiness, born of concentration. The simile given here is this, just as there might be a lake fed from spring water with no inflow from outside sources, the cool fount of water welling up in the lake would make the cool water drench, steep, fill, pervade the lake. So, again, there's a sense of a pervasive beauty, pervasive joy, like a cool spring feeding a body of water. Um, your body, the body of your experience, your phenomenal field in this state is saturated with joy, beauty. The third jhana, the sort of um, rapturous, vigorous quality of joy in um, the PT comes to be experienced as, as, as too much, too agitated, too complicated, just too, too. <laughs> and it drops away and what's left is that sweet, quiet sukha. Rather than read it all, I'm gonna skip over to the uh, simile. Just as in a pond of blue or red or white lotuses, some lotuses are born growing in the water, remain immersed in the water without rising out of it and are filled, completely surrounded by this quiet joy. That's sukha, that's happiness without the sort of um, rock and roll rapture of piti. This is quiet and it's lovely. In the fourth jhana, even 
the quiet joy of sukha is too much. Happiness is too much. And it is let go of. And the analogy here, it can be a little hard to see how this would be a attractive uh, prospect, but um, speaking from experience, it is. It's remarkable. Just as a man might be sitting wrapped from head to foot with a white cloth so that there'd be no part of his whole body that's not covered by the white cloth, so too the bhikkhu sits pervading this body with a pure, bright mind so that there is no part of their whole body that's not pervaded by the pure, bright mind. And the characteristic tone or quality of experience is um, equanimity, not pleasant, not unpleasant, just balanced, upeka. Um, it can be hard to describe, and it can be hard in describing it to convey how wholesome a feeling it is. But in my own experience, it's like everything, <laughs> I'm hesitant to put it this way, but this is how it felt. Everything was like styrofoam, a uniform, white-gray equanimity not passionate, not detached, just present. So I'm not sure where this quote comes from. Um, it all comes down to the person you look for in a crowded room. But I uh, look for it today to have a slide to um, emblemize, uh, illustrate the, the story I'm going to give now, the sort of analogy in what it's like to work with the breath um, to uncover and generate the jhana states. The analogy, you find the breath in a set location. Typically, um, it's often recommended um, to work with the breath as uh, the presence just outside the nostrils. And you look to um, relate to the breath, to connect with the breath, to be with the breath for minute after minute, sitting after sitting, walking meditation, eating in silence, everything you do, you're looking to stay with the breath in that location as a sort of constant fact, a constant presence. And so for me, an analogy is like looking for a friend in a crowded room. You see them off and on, and then you lose the connection. Someone steps in front of you. Someone starts talking to you. You go back, you go back, you go back. Stay with the breath. Stay with the breath. Stay with the breath. And you're not looking to analyze. Is it warm? Is it cool? Is it short? Is it long? Just sort of the fact, the presence, the institution of breath just outside the nostril. You get better over the hours and days tracking the breath, tracking your friend in the room. And then at some point, they turn around and look at you. This is the ekagata. You are locked on. And it's almost like there's nothing else in the room, but you and your friend, and you're staring at each other. This is approaching what's called access concentration in some of the uh, formulations of the jhanas. You're ready for absorption. And the face, the sign, the appearance, the phenomenal event that is your friend 
becomes in working with the breath, a synesthetic event. You start to see their face as a glowing ball, as a beautiful, fascinating light or orb. A lot of folks at this point when I give talks kind of zone out. Bear with me until we get to the alteration, to the synesthesia. But it is remarkable. This is the counterpart sign. You see a light. You see a cotton ball. Your mind knows there's a jewel or something along those lines. Different people see, experience different things just outside your nose. My Fantasy, my hunch is that given this is all you're doing hour after hour, day after day, your neurology, your brain has nothing better to do than to get on board with this process, with this practice, with this endeavor. And it starts to show you your object. You know what it is. You see a, a pearl in your mind, in the location of your breath outside your nose, and you know that's your breath. It's a translation. It's a synesthetic um, representation. It is the counterpart sign, the Patibanga Nimitta. And once you've got that sign constant, that's the first jhana. You've applied your attention, you're sustaining your attention, you've got rapture, you've got contentment. And with the ability now to see the breath, you've got in effect a biofeedback framework, a biofeedback situation. You can enhance your connection with the breath by gazing on that sign, that representation, that phenomenal focal hallucination, if you will. You know what it is. <laughs> and you can make it brighter. You can make it larger. And you can let it take over. The sense of distinction between you as an observer and the nimitta as an observed object, that structure falls away and there's just the light with the joy and the pleasure. That's the second jhana. Everything is the breath. Everything is the light. And at some point, this is often days, if not uh, subsequent retreats over years, the sense of uh, rapture, the uh, kind of rock and roll happiness is too much. And it subsides and uncovers, as it will, if you will, um, um, just this quiet contentment. And that's the third genre. And then even quiet contentment is felt to be too much, too produced, too generated, too complicated. And you uncover, you allow, you are embraced by the fourth genre which is equanimity. Not good, not bad, not pleasant, not unpleasant, just presence. Now, in my own case, I initially misheard the instruction where the instruction was to hang out with something constant just outside your nose. My mind went to the tactile template, the receptivity of my upper lip. So rather than hanging out with the breath just above the lip, I'm hanging out with the sensation, the reception, as it were, of the breath on my upper lip. And I got a tactile nimitta. This was, I'm losing track now, 12, 13 years ago, I practiced the um, um, jhanas pretty uh, concertedly for four or five years and no longer do them very often. But my neurology has changed. 
I still, most days, at some point in the day, have a tingling, pleasant sense of, of presence on my upper lip. The nimata is still there. In my case, I've got this tingling. I've got this presence. I can, in my mind, see this circular spot on my lip that is my nimitta. And as I give myself over to it, as absurd as it may sound, it was beautiful. It's inherently attractive. It starts to propagate that sense of pleasure, that sense of wonder, that sense of joy in and as a tactile uh, event starts to spread all over my face, all over my body. Afterwards, I was reminded of the image by Dolly. The entire dermis lit up. It was amazing. <laughs> it was beautiful. And as I say, I've done that practice, uh, not so much in recent years, but I, I did it rather concertedly for, for, for a number of years and ended up learning a great deal about what the mind is capable of. The jhanas as taught in the sort of um, more demanding Vasudhimaga style, um, are, as I no doubt have given some indication, markedly altered states of functioning. They're amazing. And after several retreats, I was able to do them at home. And after a couple of years doing them every day, I went on another retreat, 10 days of intensive immersion in absorption practices, came home and for a period of about five weeks, I was waking up at night in the middle of the jhana sequence. Some part of me knew how to do the jhanas while it was also another part of me doing sleep. I had previously had the experience a few times of uh, meditating during a dream and becoming lucid, realizing where I was, realizing I was dreaming. Um, doing a meditation in the dream. This was different. This is coming out of dreamless sleep in the middle of the sequence with what well, I can only sort of uh, gesture towards um, an inadequate uh, language as a sort of body memory of having done, say, the first two jhanas before I woke up and was in the third jhana. And a way that just fascinates me. And I'll say in personal terms, a way I am grateful for these practices is it highlights what the mind is capable of and specifically highlights how waking, dreaming, jhana absorption are all generated states. We typically, of course, identify most with our cognitive intellective waking mode, but that mode comes from somewhere. That mode is a Johnny come lately. It, like sleep, like dreams, like John absorptions, is a generated phenomenon. And I'm reminded, I often use this uh, illustration. This is how a um, evening primrose appears to us. This is how we see it. This is how the same flower may well appear to a bumblebee or a moth. Bumblebees and moths and butterflies can see ultraviolet. Our eyes don't register ultraviolet. These, this is a picture of the same flower photographed with film that is sensitive to UV radiation, UV wavelengths of the spectrum. 
like animata and like all our phenomenal experiencing, like the breath experienced as a light or a jewel or a ball of cotton, it's all a display. We are forever storying the world in our phenomenal experience. We're forever generating a kind of perceptual poem. And I'm going to um, come to a close here in referencing an image from a later Buddhist school, the, the Zen school, and particularly Hakuin, um, where this sort of dynamic is, is illustrated. The monkey here is the, the mind, the thinking mind. The moon is an appearance, is a phenomenal display. And until and unless we appreciate it as such, well, we're forever um, missing out. We're forever in a sort of deluded relationship to our own experience. The talk that I've given here is um, uh, about altered states, about fairly rare and intensive uh, modes of experience, which you can uh, generate, allow, precipitate, uncover through a variety of means. Um, the way I was trained is in using the breath. And it can get pretty exotic seeming. It can get potentially esoteric sounding. But in the end, it's all in the service of appreciating the wonder that's around us all the time. And that sort of basic appreciation, that sort of connection with what is going on, it's not an escape from reality. It is an immersion and a, a, a playful, serious engagement with what's happening in all moments. Reminds me of uh, another aspect of the story, um, the legendary portrayal of the moment, the night of the Buddha's awakening. He starts in looking to embrace and be more balanced by accepting the place of joy and pleasure in life, in appreciating our being. And that recollection uh, ushers him into the, the jhana states on the other side of which he realizes uh, a full awakening, a full appreciation of how everything is a constructed phenomenal display. On his way there in the legendary tales, the demons are worried. If this guy wakes up, we're going to be out of business. <laughs> and in the mythic portrayal, they challenge him. By what right? On what authority? By what foundation do you purport to become awakened? Buddha means awakened. And in response, he reaches down and touches the earth. In some versions of the story, the earth touches back. Just that emblem of uh, utter simplicity, a reconnection with the foundation of experience and mind. So that's the talk. Let me see how um, I might get back out of this and stop that screen and come back here. So again, I want to thank uh, Professors uh, Garrett and uh, Salguero for organizing the event and to the sponsors for it. Um, I hope I've given some indication of the worth and wonder of uh, contemplative practices in general and specifically the um, Buddhist absorption techniques and uh, the role the breath, the beautiful breath can play in that endeavor. Thank you.